So, the Atlanteans turn around or they wake up in the morning and there's no warm coffee and uh, the, the slippers are not beside the beds and they suddenly discover that their Mark II progeny has um, been seduced away. You can imagine the state that they're in. It was a tremendous ire, a wrath, that they had been snubbed again. And the result of this ire was the unleashing of a fully global thermonuclear war, what we might want to call an atomic war. And the myths, believe it or not, are replete with this. From Celtic Ireland, when I was 13, I'm sitting reading uh, information from my own legends pertaining to violence and war with uh, super technological weaponry and so forth. Here from the Egyptian mythologies. So the gods were brought together. Ra addressed Nun. Behold, mankind who came from my eye have been scheming against me. Nun replied, O oh, Ra, if your eye was turned against those, how greatly would they fear you? Hathor said, I have prevailed over mankind, and it is pleasant to my heart. Then Ra said, Now that I am in control of them, do not reduce them any more. Behold it, the eye will be stronger than all the gods. It has mastered those who dwellest at the ends of the earth. It is sovereign over every god. This is spell 316 from the coffin texts. They will fall howling on their faces, and ma all mankind will cringe beneath you and your might. They will respect you when they behold you in the vigorous form which the master of the primeval gods gave you. So even in the Egyptian mythologies, we're hearing about a punitive god, punitive deities, holding man, their creations, in utter servitude and threatening to destroy them should there be any form of disobedience. In Revelation 12, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. O my people that dwelleth in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee, after the manner of Egypt. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hands is mine indignation. Scholars like Commons Beaumont have drawn attention to the fact that when you hear about the rod and the staff, these are actually weapons that is being referred to. In Samuel 4, Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the land of these almighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all manner of plagues in the wilderness. There were the giants famous from the beginning, says the book of Baruch, that were so great of stature and so expert in war. So here we have it, gods and giants who are expert not in bringing peace and feeding the poor, but in war. From Manetho, one of the first historians in the world, the Egyptian pharaoh's historian Manetho, he speaks of the era of the pharaoh Amenophis. His was an intensely dramatic era which culminated in a prolonged war the invasion of his country by vast and well-armed hordes, accompanied by meteorological events of a phenomenal character, and finally ended in the great catastrophe which destroyed him and most of his nation. Now this appears to be history of a later date than what I'm talking about. I'm speaking of something originally in the Garden of Eden 11 or more thousand years ago, and Manetho, of course, is writing a lot later, but we're going to soon see the answer to that. In the Ipuwer Papyrus, 1780 BC, we read, The land to its whole extent, confusion and terrible noise. For nine days there was no exit from the palace, and no one could see the face of his fellow. Towns were destroyed by mighty tides. Upper Egypt suffered devastation, blood everywhere, pestilence throughout the country. The Book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Well, I didn't write it. There it is. In two kings, second kings, the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Ezekiel 5. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, 
Surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall my eyes spare, neither will I have any pity. So we're talking about the Atlantean gods having absolutely no pity. They retaliate, the Lemurians try to retaliate because they have weaponry too and they're intelligent and have psychic power also. But there is a tremendous campaign of hatred from the uh, Atlantean side here that later chroniclers, that's later chroniclers, mythographers in the Bible, they're referring to periods much earlier than the dates in which they were writing. This has been proven. In Ezekiel 6, Then shalt ye know that I am the Lord, when their slain men shall be among their idols, round about their altars and on every hill, in all the tops of the mountains and under every green tree and under every thick oak, the place where they did offer sweet savor to all their idols, so will I stretch out my hand upon them and make the land desolate, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 5, So I will send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee, and I the Lord have spoken it. Exodus 9, The hand of the Lord will strike with a deadly pestilence, to your livestock in the field. Job 1. The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. In the book of Job, one person is saying that everything is destroyed. God has destroyed. You should read it. If you read the book of Job, it will clearly show you that some kind of atomic weaponry was being used here. In Jeremiah 4, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. In Joshua 10, As they fled from before Israel, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them to Azekah, and they died. And there were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So God's killing more people with his uh, rocks and hailstones here than the, his servants were doing with the sword. In Psalms 18, the Lord also thundered in the heaven, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. In Psalms 97, a fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. The Bible makes fascinating reading. It really does. It's better than any of the Marvel comics or any kind of, uh, you know, Rambo movies. Psalms 97 again, his lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. Job 14. He shall flee from the iron weapon and the bow shall strike him through. Okay, we got iron weapons now. Please note that. In Isaiah 16, chapter 16, we have, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury. So we got whirlwinds and chariots now. In the book of Peter, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. In Isaiah 2, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. A close reading of the language concerning divine retribution compels one to contradict the supernatural context commonly espoused by clerics and annotators. The rhetoric of the Bible concerning God's wrath does not appear to be caused by mere spiritual indignation. The language and tone of the scriptures is patently martial, vindictive, and catastrophic, and does not seem to be an expression of the divine agency seeking to right spiritual or moral sins. And this has to be taken very, very seriously. When we read any of these passages, I'm just canvassing a few. This is physical. This uh, retribution and these attacks and this violence is a very physical thing. 
It's not the language of a moral God seeking to rectify moral sins or culpability. Commons Beaumont, in his uh, fantastic tome, The Riddle of the Prehistoric Britain, has this to say. Another prolific source of misunderstanding of the past is related to the vexed question of chronology. The Old Testament offers especially a flagrant example in this matter, for here the sequence of history was deliberately tampered with. Some dates are hundreds of years out of their true order. So again, when you're reading the Bible, make sure that you realize that even if you can date the existence of that prophet, which is tough enough, just because he wrote something down or just because a chapter or a passage is attributed to a particular date does not mean that that chronology is correct. Far from it. Beaumont goes on to say, in examining the scriptures, we must frequently ignore the apparent chronological eccentricities of the prophets of Israel. The Bible is a book of hidden meanings and many events which relate to a far earlier date than which men like Israel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are supposed to have lived. And Beaumont says, the history of the Old Testament is the history of Atlantis. The scholar just cuts it to the quick. When you're reading about these issues and the whole story of the Old Testament, you are reading about not only a much earlier time, but you are reading about the pre-Diluvian civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, a lengthy tome of, the Indi of India, that book tells of a demon race which invaded the three planetary systems. Opposing the demons was the Hindu god Shiva, who possessed a powerful weapon that he fired at the enemy spaceships, uh, excuse me, enemy airships from his own. Ovid, the Latin writer, giants attacked the very throne of heaven, Jove struck them down. Three times had Poseidon ventured with stern countenance to thrust his arms out of the water. Three times he was unable to endure the scorching heat of the air. In the Norse Edda of the, Teut of the Teutons and the Scandinavian uh, people, they have the great winters, the, wind, the winter of the wind, the winter of the sword, and the winter of the wolf. The second winter is called the winter of the sword. Those of mankind left alive rob and slay one another for what is left to feed on. Brother slays brother, Mighty battles occur in the world. In Alan Alford's Gods of the New Millennium, he writes, The people, terrified, could hardly breathe. Mouths were drenched in blood. Heads wallowed in blood. The face was made pale by the evil wind. The Algonquian Indians, they have this to say. Long ago, two powerful manitos, that's two powerful gods, felt themselves insulted by the hero Wasaka. This put them into a fearful passion, and intending to kill their enemy, they raged and roared over the earth, which heaved and shook under their angry steps. The Tahoe Indians. There was a time when their tribe possessed the whole earth and were strong and numerous and rich, but a day came when a people rose up stronger than they and defeated and enslaved them. Afterward, the Great Spirit sent an immense wave across the continent from the sea, and this wave engulfed both the oppressors and the oppressed, but a very small remnant were surviving. So again, in the early legends, even though they're composite tales and they're sanctified by time, we always hear somewhat of the same refrain, two opposing groups, uh, the intervention of gods, wrathful gods, heroes that are in opposition to the gods. The motifs may be the same, even though the individual treatment may be more colorful and different. The Persian legends in the Bundahis book the Bundahis is a tribe and the Persian legends, they say, and ninety days and nights the heavenly angels were contending in the world and the confederate demons of the evil spirit. In the Siberian legends, northern Russia, in the beginning was the earth, but then a great fire arose and raged for seven years and the earth was burned up. Everything became sea and the Tungas were consumed except a boy and a girl who rose up with an eagle in the sky rose up with an eagle in the sky. In the Bolivian records, going back some 5,000 years, tells of the destruction of civilization in far-off times as a result of conflict with some non-human race whose blood was not red like ours. Blood not red like ours. Well, what is blood? We were talking earlier about the genetic connection. 
in the Norse Edda again, and the head of Mimir, fountain of all wisdom, counsels Odin to meet on the field of Vigrid and to wage there such a war that the power of evil would be destroyed forever, even though his own world would be destroyed with them. So the skalds, that's the great Celtic and Teutonic skalds, are saying that the war was so bad that they even contemplated destroying the, their own planet, the whole world, in order to be rid of the evil that they were fighting. Now death is the portion of doomed men, red with blood the buildings of gods. The sun turns black in the summer after the winds whine. Earth sinks in the sea, the sun turns black. Cast down from heaven are the hot stars. Fumes reek, into flames burst. The sky itself is scorched with fire. Obviously this account is talking about the ferocity of the weaponry being used by both sides. Ignatius Donnelly, one of the first American authors to study and write on Atlantis, uh, commenting on the book of Job, he has this to say, it sounds like the cry not of a man but of a race, a great religious civilized race who could not understand how God could so cruelly visit the world. And this brings up a very important point. Here Donnelly is talking about the cry of the race. We talked earlier about the Elohim and the Jehovah and the Adams. It has to be understood that if we read the Bible in the personal, if we think Adam is just an individual and Eve is just an individual and the serpent is an individual, we're not understanding how these ancient myths work. When we read Jehovah or Elohim or Adam or Eve, we have to think race. We have to think multiplicities of people. Then the story unfolds correctly. Jack Barringer in his past shock puts it this way. It is one of in one of the most tragic ironies, the majority of humans continue to worship those gods who abuse them the most. And that's what we're still doing. Perhaps that accounts, would it not, for some of the predicaments that we find ourselves in right now? And again, in the ancient mythologies, plenty of reference to the super technological weaponry. Here from the Celtic myth and legend, uh, Charles Squire uh, writes of one of our greatest gods, after Nada, the king of the Celts, his sun god, that's his right-hand man, so to speak, was Lu, the famous god Lu. And of Lu, he says, he also had a magic spear, which he had no need to wield himself, for it was alive and thirsted for blood. When battle was near, it was drawn out. Then it roared and struggled against its thongs. Fire flashed from it. It tore through and through the ranks of the enemy, never tired of slaying. So again, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, this may have seemed just like mythology, just like folk tales, not worth paying attention to. But today, as our own technology advances, we can revisit this. Does this not sound like a heat-seeking missile or heat-seeking weapon? As we progress into the future, we can now look back with more clarity to the mythologies of the ancient world. In Zechariah 9, And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. In Proverbs 20, a wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. Jeremiah 30, behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Exodus 7, and Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up his rod and smote the waters that were in the river. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. One of the greatest sources for this kind of uh, testimonial of ancient times is the Hindu tome, the Mahabharata. But any Hindu scholar will tell you that the dates given for the Mahabharata are far too recent. This tome could be, they speculate, um, as old as 6,000 years. From the Mahabharata, we read this. The Subha clung to the sky at a league's length. He threw at me rockets, missiles, spears, spikes, battle axes, three-bladed javelins, flamethrowers, without pausing. The sky seemed to hold a hundred suns, a hundred moons, and a hundred myriad stars. Neither day nor night could be made out, or the point of the compass. In the battle of the Mahabharata, the warrior king Arjuna was disturbed about the fact that so many would perish. 
his god and counselor, Lord Krishna, replied to Arjuna's remonstrations, saying, Fear not to kill those before you, for they are already dead. This is the most mysterious comment and has caused a great deal of debate. Already dead. Not fully human, perhaps. Now in the Ramayana, another Hindu book, we have mention of an iron thunderbolt capable of killing hundreds of thousands of humans. It was also said to be so powerful that it could have destroyed the earth. These weapons could only be used by royal decree. There is even passages where it mentions the fact that the weapon was used as a re in retaliation for the other side using it first. Now where have we heard that story before? In the Samargahana Sudrahara, there is mention of a manned space rockets as well as their means of propulsion. In the Samara Sudrahara, we find mention of the use of biological weapons, each of which produced its own results. The Samhara debilitated its victims by attacking the motor centers of the brain. And the Moha caused blockage of nerve impulses, resulting in complete paralysis. In a Chinese book, we find similar descriptions of germ warfare, and again references made to specific weapons causing specific results. Just like today's world. Now the Indian philosopher Ulukya discussed in his teachings the miniature solar system within the atom, molecular construction and transformation, as well as the theory of relativity more than 2,800 years before Einstein. Now when the Mahabharata was to be translated in the last half of the 19th century into the modern languages, the fanciful descriptions of ancient warfare were generally ignored. Now why would that be? If no one has anything to lose, just like the old glacialists and ice age theorists, if you have nothing to lose, why remove these passages? In Mohanjo-daro in India, what was found corresponds exactly to what was found at Nagasaki, where everything was crystallized, fused, or melted. This mysterious event was recorded in the Mahabharata. One scholar, one uh, professor who was excavating, actually found a corpse in a chair that had basically turned to glass. His whole body and the walls and the chair had been fused into what appeared to be glass, but under tremendous heat. In the Mahabharata we read stunning passages like this. It was as if the elements had been unleashed. The sun spun round, scorched by the incandescent heat of the weapon, the world reeled in fever. Elephants were set on fire by the heat and ran to and fro in a frenzy. Water boiled, animals died, the enemy was mown down, and the raging of the blaze made the trees collapse. Horses and war chariots were burned up. Thousands of chariots were destroyed. Then deep silence descended on the sea. The corpses of the fallen were mutilated by the terrible heat so that they no longer looked like human beings. Never before have we seen such a ghastly weapon, and never before have we heard of such a weapon. A single projectile charged with all the power of the universe an incandescent column of smoke and fire as bright as 10,000 suns, from a shaft fatal as the rod of death, endowed with the force of a thousand-eyed Indra's thunder. It was as destructive to all living creatures. Hostile warriors fell to the earth like trees burned down in a raging fire. A substance like fire has sprung into existence, blistering hills, rivers, and trees. All are being reduced to ashes. You cruel and evil ones, drunk with pride, through that iron bolt, you shall become exterminators of your race. From Protap Chandra Roy's translation of the Mahabharata in 1889, we read Gurkha flying in his swift and powerful Vimana, hurled against the three cities of the Vrishis and the Adhakas, a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe. It was the unknown weapon, the iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnis and the Andhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Their hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. This weapon was so feared that, in great distress of mind, the king had the bolt reduced to fine powder and thrown into the sea. 
even with these precautions, people's hair and fingernails fell out overnight. Birds turned white and their legs became scarlet and blistered and the food went bad. Jonathan Cray in Dead Men's Secrets, he says that in Pakistan, 44 exhumed skeletons appear from the year 2000 BC were found to be radioactive. And he goes into many other such cases like that. And all over the world there are such cases. In Scotland, for instance, uh, a uh, old fort or castle on a hillside, the entire corner of it was fused glass. They're finding 14-inch uh, thick glass under the Syrian and Iraqi desert to this day. There is good reason to believe that the terms Sodom and Gomorrah actually relate to Atlantis and Lemuria. We read, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plains and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Genesis 24. In the story of Lot, the famous story of his wife and the pillar of salt, this is actually a mistranslation. It wasn't pillar of salt. The translated word is more like our modern vapor. So she was actually turned to a pillar of vapor. In Charles Berlitz, Atlantis, the eighth continent, he says after finding layers of Babylonian and Sumerian artifacts, the archaeologist had passed through 14 feet of clay, which indicated a prolonged flood. Below this strata was reached a level of fused glass the same kind found at Alamogordo in Texas after the A-bomb blasts. In western Scotland, there's a fort that has one of its sides completely fused into glass and the same manner. It had received some intense heat, but it was not lightning. Now, Frederick Soddy, no less, this is one of the greatest uh, physicists that ever lived. In his book, The Interpretation of Radium, in 1909, he is commenting on the Mahabhatra and says, can we not read in them some justification for the belief that some forgotten race of men attained not only the knowledge that we have so recently won, but also that power that is not yet ours? I believe that there have been civilizations in the past that were familiar with atomic energy and that by misusing it, they were totally destroyed. Now, a theoretical physicist and supervising scientist of the Manhattan Project Robert Oppenheimer, who was familiar with ancient uh, Sanskrit literature, was giving a lecture at Rochester University when a student asked a question to which Oppenheimer gave a strangely qualified answer. And the questioner stood up and said, Sir, was the bomb exploded at Alamogordo during the Manhattan Project the first one to be detonated? Now that's a peculiar question in itself. Perhaps this person was familiar with the nuances of the ancient world. So he asks this peculiar question to Dr. Robert Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer's answer is even more perplexing. Well, yes, in modern times, of course. Now, Professor Hermann Oberth, this is literally the father of rocketry and was the German rocket scientist um, expert during the period of the Nazis. He says, we cannot take credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped by peoples of other worlds. And then we have etymology again. We have the word typhoon, which relates to a very strong, powerful whirlwind that is uh, destructive in its nature. This word actually comes from typhon, or the typhonian beast. Typhon was the great serpent. And the word hurricane, as we saw earlier, Cain is the word for the serpent. It's one of the earliest terms uh, for the serpent, just like Cannes in south of France, Cannes Film Festival. Hurricane, the shaking of the serpent, a fierce wind. So in all the mythologies of the world, we hear about the fighting, the conflict of the demon race against the, the high ones. The Mahabharata, the Celtic legends, and the War of Troy are all meant to have gone on simultaneously, in fact, in history. Now we come to look at the result of all of this. Now we need to look at if there was, in fact, a war about 11,000 years ago, if the original alien masters arrived here approximately 50,000 years ago, and if this war broke out in the region of 13,500 years ago, as the fossil record now seems to be um, hinting and saying, then we need to say, 
what has happened since that period. And we find that there was an unforeseen variable. Because if there was indeed a war of the gods, and if evil came into being due to the repeated bio-manipulation of Homo sapien, then why is it that neither side seems to have triumphed? That's right. How come it is that we're here 13,000 or 11,000 years later debating this problem, debating this question? Because, say, the Atlanteans had won and evil had a triumphed, we certainly wouldn't have been sitting here contemplating the question. We wouldn't have this inner dichotomy as good versus evil. And if the other side had won, the Lemurians had conquered, we'd all be living in peace and happiness and tranquility. So why are we not? Why 11,000 years later, a huge vast expanse of time between where we are now and these events that we're referring to here? How come this problem still persists and has never been resolved? This is the stumbling block for most of the scholars and researchers. And the reason is quite startling. The reason, the unforeseen variable, the, that event that delayed the denouement was none other than a polar shift of the earth, a pole shift of the axis of the earth. And again, where do we turn for the information regarding this uh, polar shift to the mythologies of the world? Now, Alan and Dallaire, in their book, When the Earth Nearly Died, they say that studies have shown that about 10,178 BC, or over 12,000 years ago, the celestial pole was inclined at an angle of 30 degrees from its present position. This, in turn, strongly suggests that the terrestrial axis then orientated differently from today. The gigantic worldwide tectonic disturbances of the late Pleistocene times occurred almost simultaneously on a near unimaginable scale, precisely what could be expected from a powerful external influence, but not from the Ice Age conditions conventionally believed to have existed then. Significantly, a drop in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field appears to have occurred sometime between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, attended by various other important changes including earthquakes, volcanism, water table fluctuations, and large-scale climactic variations. Of these, severe earthquakes in particular may even induce axial wobble and polarity reversals. So they're talking about the comets, they're talking about the possible destruction of Tiamat, that we looked at earlier. They're talking about Tiamat's water by pouring artificially into our Earth, onto our Earth. That may have precipitated a polar wobble or a pole shift. Edmund Haley, after Haley's comet, he was the first modern scientist to account for the deluge by polar displacement. When he first argued his case before the Royal Society of London in 1692, the revelation was so startling that his paper was not published until 30 years later. We are not talking about something small here. We're talking about the Eiffel Tower stuck head first in Georgia. We're talking about rocks the size of cathedrals charging through the air and landing thousands of miles away from where they are. We're talking about seas emptying out of their basins and so forth. This is a calamity the likes of which the Earth had never seen. This is not something that even approximates the first deluge. Water pouring in from another planet that's just been destroyed, that's one thing. It causes tremendous upheaval in the world. But maybe after a few hundred years, there's a semblance of normality returns. But pole shift, that's quite something else again. The destruction that would come with such an event can hardly be estimated. In Celtic mythology, um, Albion, that's the British Isles, England, Wales, Scotland, and so on, they have been referred to as the Fortunate Isles or the Blessed Isles because it was known by the ancestors that they had survived such travesties. In the Book of Enoch, Enoch is saying, I saw in a vision how the heavens collapsed, and when it fell to earth, I saw how the earth was swallowed up in a great abyss, and I lifted up my voice to cry aloud and said, The earth is destroyed. Larry Brian Radke, in his book Astronomical Revelation, says, And the pillars of heaven were broken, the earth shook to its foundations, the heavens sunk lower towards the north, the sun, the moon, and the stars changed their motions, the earth fell to pieces, and the waters enclosed within its bosom burst forth with violence and overflowed it. The grand harmony of nature was disturbed. Now Brian Radke and some of the other scholars 
are happy to tell you that these events that they have researched and they know existed and they know occurred, but they're looking to comets and to other natural phenomena. And my thesis, in my work, in my reading of the texts, these events were precipitated by human error, and by human uh, interference. In Chinese mythology, over 2,000 years BC, in ancient times, Kung Kung strove with Chuan Shu for the empire. Angered, he smote the unrotating mountain. Heaven's pillars broke. The bonds of the earth were ruptured. Heaven leaned over to the northwest. Hence, the sun, moon, and stars and planets were shifted in the southeast. Well, that's right. Any kind of axial wobble, any kind of pole shift, if anyone even survives this, they're certainly not going to be seeing the same heavens, the same stars, the same positions of the luminaries. Everything will be seen to be in chaos. Absolute confusion will reign. Clifford Wilson, in Chariot Still Crash, so terrible was the storm that even the gods appeared at the deluge. They took flight and went into the heaven of Anu, cowered they like dogs and crouched down at the outer defenses. Well, of course, you can imagine that the, the gods who unleashed this war weren't prepared for this. They didn't realize that the ferocity of their own weaponry would precipitate a pole shift, would precipitate an axial wobble, would precipitate the moisture of the air being completely incinerated, which would then affect the magnetic shield of the earth and the Roche limit, which then in turn would attract some more of the debris that was already out there from Tiamat. So again, more ice, more rain falling to the earth. Now the word Atlas in Greek actually means the one who could not withstand the skies. And in Sanskrit, Atlantis or Atlas means deprived of its pillar, the bottomless, sunk to the bottom. Poseidon, this is the famous god, of course, of the ocean, but specifically he was the monarch of Atlantis. Po comes from the word Sirius, and Don, the lord of. And he was known as the creator of men, but also as the god of earthquakes. So here in one mysterious word, Poseidon, we have the whole story being told. Poseidon is the god of the waters. Poseidon is the god of Atlantis. But Poseidon is the earth shaker, the one who brings the earthquakes upon mankind. And his name means the lord of Sirius, meaning from another place, from the stars, from the outer worlds. So it was that earth lost the continent spoken of in the world's great legends. Appalachia, or Atlantis, Tyrrhenia, Oceania, Beringia, Fenoscandia. So today when scholars and antiquarians and archaeologists are digging around the Mediterranean area and saying that they've discovered Atlantis, no. They've discovered a great civilization that perhaps was controlled by Atlantis, because Atlantis was an empire. The city of London in ancient times during its uh, empire controlled many areas of the world, and likewise did Atlantis. From the Toltec, Song of the Feathered Serpent, Tolan's towers are burned. Quetzalcoatl and his family are arrived here after the death of his homeland. From the Hopi, Song of the Flood, down in the bottom of the sea is the proud cities and the worldly treasures corrupted with evil. From Ezekiel 17, though you be sought for, yet shall you never be found again. From the Egyptian papyri, South becomes north, they say, and the earth turns over. From the Laplanders of northern Sweden, their mythologies say, I shall reverse the world. I shall bid the rivers flow upward. I shall cause the sea to gather together itself up into a huge towering wall, which I shall hurl upon you wicked earth children, and thus destroy them and all life. The Aztecs. Our forefathers dwelt in that happy and prosperous place they called Atslan. In this happy place is the great mountain in the middle of the waters called Kulhuacan, because it is the point turned over towards the bottom. And for this reason, it is called Kulhuacan, meaning the crooked mountain. Kulhuacan from Kulhua means the serpent mountain. So here again, we have the same motifs, the same refrain, the crooked mountain, the mountain that used to be one direction, but is now turned over and it was the place of the serpents. The Miztecs. The Miztecs, another instructed Mexican tribe, described the Culhuacan as the place of heaven, where the gods erected a sumptuous palace and dwelt therein. 
a great deluge occurred there in which many of the sons and daughters of the gods perished. And the Athenians of Greece, a priest of Sais, told Solon, that's Plato's father, when the mighty power aggressing against the whole of Europe and Asia was held at bay by Athens alone, this vast power, he said, wantonly made war and endeavored to subdue at one blow our country, Egypt, and yours, Athens, and the whole of the land. That same vast power failed in their efforts, and then the great catastrophe suddenly burst upon the invaders and defenders. Nonas, the historian, in his work, he says, there was a tumult in the sky, shaking the joints of the immovable universe. The very axle which runs through the middle of the revolving heavens was bent. In Plato's Timaeus, forwards and backwards, and again to the right and left, and upwards and downwards, wandering every way in all six directions. In one day and one fatal night, there came mighty earthquakes and inundations that engulfed the warlike peoples. In the book of Baruch, there were the giants famous from the beginning that were so of great stature and so expert in war, but they were destroyed because they had no wisdom and perished through their own foolishness. The Russian mystic writer, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky writes, under the evil insinuations of their demon, Thevetat, the Atlantis race became a nation of evil magicians. The giants and magicians and all flesh died and every man. And Commons Beaumont writes, the prehistory of the Atlanteans and the race of Adam possessed peculiar similarities. The supermen of Plato's island were drowned in a flood like the Adamites, the giants of old time, men of renown, the men whose thoughts became wholly evil, destroyed in what is called the flood or universal deluge. The cause advanced for their destruction was in effect the same in both cases, they being accused of having mastered too many of the divine secrets of or as we should say, science, as the ancients named it, the gods. Herodotus, the ancient historian, I observed that there were seashells upon the hills and that salt excluded from the soil to such an extent as even to injure the pyramids. So he's talking about the sea level, that around the pyramids and around the Sphinx, definitely there was salt water at one time. And Tony Bushby in his Secret of the Bible says, some researchers advanced the possibility that seashells provided evidence that the Great Pyramid was erected before the deluge, a theory supported by much abused Arabian traditions, supported by the narratives in the Book of the Dead and by a curious watermark running round the Great Pyramid two-thirds distance up its face. The Zuni Indians say, earthquakes shook the world and rent it, Creatures turn fierce, becoming beasts of prey, wherefore others turn timid. Wretchedness and hunger abounded, black magic, war, and contention entered into the hearts of men and creatures. So in the Zuni myths, they're saying, they're talking about the coming of evil. They're, coming, they're saying that the mentality, the behavior of animals changed, and the mental uh, paranoia and schizophrenia of the human race began. In the book of Habakkuk, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went. Joshua 10, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. So here we have in one passage of the Bible the, the idea that the scriptures are saying that not only was there a war, but celestial events were awry, and that there was two, again, opposing peoples, a tremendous war that couldn't be abated. From the Bible again, the earth is utterly broken down, moved exceedingly. So the earth is moved exceedingly. Isaiah 24, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. So how come we haven't heard about this in Sunday school? How come the pastors and the preachers are not explaining what this passage means? In Second Peter we read, For this they are willingly ignorant of. The world that was then, being overflowed with water, perished. So why is it that when we hit the Sunday school, we're taking the Bible classes, 
no pastor or preacher goes into the terms and explains what these mean. These are talking about physical events. We've been under mind control for so long, we don't even know what we're reading when we're reading it. Here we have a statement that people are willingly ignorant. The book of Peter is saying that people are willingly ignorant as to the events of the past. In John 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Yes, that's right. Sea, where it should be, is no more. Sea that was over here, it's gone. Sea that's up in the sky, a whole planet of it, Tiamat, it's no more. The whole earth is in decay and chaos. From uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, one of the early uh, pre-medieval historians of England in his book, The History of the Kings of Britain, uh, writes on the prophecies of Merlin. The moon's chariot shall run amok in the zodiac, and the Pleiades will burst into tears. None of these will return to their duty expected of it. Ariadne will shut its door and be hidden within the enclosing cloud banks. In the twinkling of an eye, the seas will rise up and the arena of the winds shall be opened once again. The winds shall do battle together with a blast of ill omen, making their din reverberate from one constellation to another. From the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, from the Apocrypha, for in the old time also, when the proud giants perished, the hope of the world governed by the hand escaped in a weak vessel and left to all ages a seed of generation. So the books that were purposely left out of the Bible, the Apocrypha, in this book they're saying there were survivors and they escaped in a weak vessel. That means some sort of vessel that was impaired, not working correctly, but they were able to escape. Now we spoke earlier about the unforeseen variable the idea that we're still inherited this problem of evil, the problem of conflict, the problem of the alien versus the human DNA in us from 11,000 years ago or more. And we've inherited because the pole shift prevented conclusion. But what we also must understand, and one of the reasons for the great delay, is that after you have had a pole shift of this kind of magnitude, it's unforeseen by the perpetrator, it's unforeseen by the oppressor, it's unforeseen by the oppressed. Both contingents were not ready for this. They had no idea that the Earth would respond this way. Like H.G. Wells talks about in his uh, time machine, that man's violence awoke the Earth. Earth's violence followed the human violence. Well, this is the same situation we find in the ancient days. And the Earth is an upheaval. The five great continents have sank beneath the waves. What goes with it? What goes with it is all the spaceships, all the crystalline computers, all the technology, all the hardware, all the rockets and weaponry that both sides have. It's all destroyed. So we have the predicament of moving mankind forward. The Atlanteans decide that they have no choice now but to move mankind forward in history, to manipulate history, to move us forward to the point where we can rebuild the technology that they have lost in ancient times. The loss of their technological hardware was a major setback and predicament for the Atlantean serpents. They decided to manipulate the flow of history and the destiny of their Adamic progeny, pushing us ever forward to the point where the super technological hardware that was destroyed in the War of the Gods could be reproduced. Some instruments and weapons had survived, and these were sequestered in underground chambers and in temple precincts, referred to as the Holy of the Holies. And the Book of Enoch, like many of the scriptures, talk about the refashioning of a lot of this weaponry. It's another motif that we read extensively in the mythologies of the world. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, and to make known to them the metals of the earth and the arts of working with them. And they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. In Druidic tradition, in Welsh tradition, we have the Perilt, these are a fraternity of powerful druids who practiced metallurgy in caverns beneath the earth, who fashioned artifacts like the cauldron of power, as well as instruments known as the gifts of the gods. That's right. They had to set about sequestering the weaponry that was left over, but they had to also subjugate the whole earth. They had to start mining. They had to start creating the metallurgy and getting the ores together to recreate all the hardware that they had lost. Because just like a gunfighter in frontier America, Stripped of your gun, you feel naked. 
You may have all the intelligence in the world, but if you haven't got the instruments of authority and power, you're naked and you're helpless. Commons Beaumont says, I have said comparatively little in regard to this prehistoric science and weapons, including firearms, although it is manifest that they played the most vital part in ancient power politics. Possession of the knowledge of metallurgy must have been one of the most urgent yet secret objects on the part of those who desire to rule the ancient world. I cannot overstress how vital and important is always the problem of weapons. The science of ancient explosives has never been historicized to my knowledge, yet it lies at the root of most prehistory, for its knowledge and application enabled those who had mastered the secret so jealously guarded the innermost of mysteries to rule over men and to claim godlike attributes. Now, Dr. R. V. Dolphin, after studying in the Libyan desert, studying the glass, Dolphin suggested that for the ancient Phoenicians to have worked with temperatures equivalent to 6,000 degrees Celsius, they must have known the secret of atomic power. 6,000 degrees, of course, is only 2,000 degrees short of the temperature of the sun. And yet here is the good doctor in the Syrian Libyan desert studying artifacts, digging up beautiful artifacts, beautiful globes and glassware. The only trouble is it's been made in furnaces which is almost atomic energy would need to be used. The temperatures are so extreme. The Smithsonian Institute and the Bureau of Standards in Washington have brought to light various objects that prove that 7,000 years ago people were producing steel in furnaces at a temperature of 9,000 degrees centigrade. And we have even from the most junior high, the most elementary level of education, a big question. How come the Iron Age, which is meant to be the earliest age, is the one that comes first? We have the Stone Age, which is the earliest period. We have the Copper Age. We have the Bronze Age. And then we have the Iron Age. So closest to us, our own time, we have the, most, uh, the least complicated. It takes a great deal more skill to make copper and bronze than it does to make simple iron. And of course, the argument always put before us is, no, iron was more um, needed because, of course, it was made into weapons. But that's a side story. That's not what we're asking. We're asking, how come the sophistication precedes? So, meaning as you go further back in time, the skill with ores gets more. Well, it's the same predicament that you have when you go to any indigenous tribe of any culture. They always talk, do they not? of their own ancestors being more sophisticated and more cunning and more artful and even sometimes more spiritual than they. Every culture, they never put themselves first. They never say, we are the smartest ones in our own history. They always talk about their own ancestors being more advanced. Now, why would that be? The mighty flood frees the ship known as the Nagalfar, a vessel that the giants were so long in building. Loki steers the ship of hell, and the Fenris wolf is aboard. This is from the Norse Edda again, the Viking mythology. And the ship, the Nagalfar, sails out from the east. At its helm, Loki, with the children of darkness, the doom bringers, offspring of monsters. Of course, anyone who spent a few uh, days or weeks studying the Viking and Scandinavian mythology, you know that Loki was the dark one. Loki is the god of evil. Well, here we have Loki flying a spaceship, refixing, refurbishing an old spaceship with this bestial weapon on board, the Fenris Wolf. After the destruction, after the demise of the four or five great continents, and Celtic mythology talks about lots of other islands as well, as we saw a little bit earlier, but if Fenoscandia, Tyrrhenia, Beringia, Atlantis, Appalachia, Oceania, if Leoness and Lachlan and all the ancient islands of Avalon that the, uh, the ancient books are talking about, if all of these have sank beneath the waves and land is scarce, but you have a certain amount of uh, survivors on both sides, both contingents have survivors, then what happens next is very important to modern history. We can surmise that the original Atlanteans were fewer in number than the progeny they later create. It goes without saying that the visitors may have been fewer than the beings that they later created. So that means that the sons of the serpent, the Lemurians, and their Adamic wards probably were larger in number 
than the contingents that were on Atlantis. No one knows for sure, but we can gather that this was the case. So when we follow the histories and the mythologies through, we find that the serpent race, this is the original Atlantean race, they decide after the pole shift to now converge at the new equator, specifically Asia Minor and Mesopotamia and Samaria. And Sumer, by the way, in Celtic, means the land of the dragon. So the original serpent race come together, what's left of them, and they decide to vacate wherever they are and regroup at the new equator, because, of course, this is the only area that would actually sustain life all the year long. So they converge in the area of Mesopotamia, Babylon, Sumeria. The sons of the serpent, that's the Lemurians, together with their Adamic wards, they choose to do the opposite. They disperse to the corners of the earth, and they take their advanced Lemurian culture with them. So the Lemurians, for some reason, decide to do the opposite. And that could be because they realized that those Atlantean warlocks of theirs could still be out there, ready to hunt them down, and that they're very vulnerable. So they make the decision to split up and send contingents to different corners and quadrants of the earth. But here at the Sumerian, Asia Minor, the Middle East, the junction of the Tigris and Euphrates River, this is the area that became the new center of empire, based, of course, on the Atlantean pattern. The word Europe. In Greek mythology, Europa was the daughter of the phoenix, which rose from the flames of destruction. And one doesn't have to be an expert in mythology to understand what this means. Europe is literally the one that has risen from the flames of destruction. Europa, the daughter of the phoenix. Dionysus of Susana says, they were the first great founders of the world's founders of cities and of mighty states who showed a path through seas before unknown and went each wandering tribe far off to share a different soil and climate. Hence arose great diversity, so plainly seen mid nations widely severed. So there we have it, folks. There is the answer. People who studied these mysteries have long wondered how come the same symbols, the same dances, the same customs, the same artwork, the same performances, the same language, all over the world we find the same shapes and images and iconography. No matter how far you go from New Zealand to Celtic Ireland, from Celtic Ireland over to the Mexicos, to North America, to China, to the Druids, to the Vikings, to even South America and Africa, we find a continuousness, a same similarity in symbolism and iconography. Well, of course, if it's one group dispersing and bringing the same culture to all parts of the world, could that not explain it? Commons Beaumont again. The ancient civilization of the land we call Egypt has been pronounced by archaeologists as flawless of its type from the very first. It reveals none of the painful steps from primeval beginnings passing through the Paleolithic, Neolithic, and Bronze Age to that of iron. It apparently burst upon the scene into exotic radiance, its perfected civilization accordingly having been described as a miracle. Science cannot admit any such miracle, and another explanation must be forthcoming. In the book of Deuteronomy, whither shall we go up, our brethren, have discouraged our heart, saying, the people are greater and taller than we, the cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. And of course, we learned earlier that the Anakim is another word for the Nephilim. So here we have in the book of Deuteronomy, eyewitnesses saying, yes, the Anakim are housing themselves in great fortified walls now. They're living behind the cities. Sir Leonard Woolley, in his book, The Ur of the Chaldees, writes, there is nothing to show to what race the first inhabitants of Mesopotamia belonged. At a date which we cannot fix, People of a new race made their way into the valley, coming whence we do not know. John Keel, in his book, Our Haunted Planet, writes, According to the traditions of many isolated peoples, the first great emperors in Asia were god kings who came down from the sky, displayed amazing superhuman abilities, and took over. 
there was a veritable worldwide epidemic of these god kings between 5000 and 1000 BC. Professor W. B. Emery, in his book Archaic Egypt, writes, at approximately 3,400 years BC, a great change took place in Egypt, and the country passed rapidly from a state of advanced Neolithic culture to two well-organized monarchies. At the same time, writing appears. Monumental architecture and the arts and crafts develop to an astonishing degree. There appears to be little or no background to these fundamental developments. Now, Dexter Perkins and Patricia Daly write in their book, Why did a lifestyle that had been so successful for tens of thousands of years give way to one so different? Modern hunting peoples, though living for the most part in marginal areas, are frequently better nourished and always more leisured than their agrarian neighbors. Agrarian peoples not only must work a good deal harder for their sustenance, but are much more precariously balanced in relation to their environment, since they have substantially altered the natural ecology of their surroundings. Diodorus Siculus writes, the Egyptians themselves claimed that their ancestors were strangers who in very remote times settled on the bank of the Nile, bringing with them the civilization of their motherland, the art of writing and a polished language. They had come from the direction of the setting sun and were the most ancient. So Diodorus here is uh, saying that the Egyptians may have been those coming from Lemuria and not Atlantis. The Atlanteans are settling somewhat more north in Sumeria, Babylon, and, to the e and to the e farther to the east. But the Egyptian paradigm may have been, in fact, based on the Lemurians who settled there. Charles Bullitz, he speaks of the new calendars. The Hindu, Egyptian, and Babylonian calendars start or commence a new cycle from the point of 11,500 years to 11,000 years BC fairly close to the figure given by Plato for the end of Atlantis, or 9,500 years before his time. And is it not from this time that we have not only the rise of the great bloodthirsty empires, but all the later empires that move up into historical times and all the paradigms that we associate with modern city life? It all originates somewhere. It originates from exactly that period of time from the Atlantean paradigm-based empires coming out of the Middle East. It's from those times that we have the concept of a removed and distant impersonal God. It's from those times that we have the concept of an evil God out there somewhere, or heaven and an afterlife. It's from those times that we have the idea of nature and woman being debased. It's from those times that we have acquired inheritance or walled cities when animals are domesticated and the coming of the meat diet. What we know is the family organization with the male invariably at the head and the separatism racially and culturally. We have military strength and warlords as heroes. We have conquest and territorialism. We have the enslavement of foreigners or an overpopulation and, and the list goes on and on and on. All of these things that now uh, pester the human race. They have an origin also, and they come out of these times about 11,000 years ago, when the history books and the scholars are only too happy to tell you it all begins then. The whole lot all begins then, and we know that this is simply not true. And James DeMio, in his fine book, Sarah's Razia, says, after 3,300 BCE, divine kingship, the despotic central state, human sacrifice, slavery, polygamy, concubinage, female seclusion, infant cranial deformation, swaddling, and circumcision appeared in Mesopotamia in fully blown institutionalized form. Eric Fromm, in his book Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, he writes, while granting that we do not have much direct knowledge of man's psyche before the beginning of the Neolithic period, there are good reasons to assume that the most primitive men were not characterized by destructiveness or sadism. In fact, the negative qualities that are commonly attributed to the human nature become more powerful and widespread as civilization developed. James DeMio goes on to say, the enterprise of Columbus, if it occurred today, would without doubt be called a genocide, with accurate comparisons to the atrocities of Hitler 
or any of the world's most cruel and thuggish brutes. The merciless enslavement, mutilation, torture, and slaughter of just under a million island Arawaks at the hands of his followers, all within a few short years of his arrival at Hispaniola. The Europeans were not the first to create havoc in the New World, and by the time of the Europeans arrived, very many patristic tribes already existed in North America. Many were already cruel and murderous. Large patristic empires preoccupied with war and human sacrifice and led by blood-drenched god-kings. Influences did come from over the Bering Strait during the years prior to 8000 BC. These earliest migrations were of a peaceful and matristic social character. Patrism simply did not exist in any significant or enduring manner at those times. There is no evidence for it. These early peaceful people spread out and populated the islands of Oceania and the Americas as well. One can travel through large parts of both North and South America and visit places which are named after peaceful Indian tribes which have altogether vanished from the face of the earth. In the book Against Civilization, with agriculture usually comes the division of labor, increased sexual inequality, and the beginnings of social hierarchy. Priests, kings, and organized and personal warfare all seem to come together in one package. And David Watson, in his Pathology of Civilization, writes, Perhaps we will never fully understand the mystery of that original mutation from egalitarian to state society. Certainly, no standard explanations are adequate. There's also a theory abounding in some researchers' minds that the Earth, in fact, suffered such a calamity during these pre-Diluvian periods that, in fact, it may be dying. Is there credence to this theory? The migration and resettlement of the surviving Atlanteans and Lemurians was compromised by the continuing Earth changes. The after-effects of the original polar shift and realignment, these changes continue to this day, being prolonged and severe. Aridity, that's the loss of moisture in the atmosphere, is the most conspicuous and devastating after-effect. But volcanoes, earthquakes, climactic deviations, erratic weather patterns, loss of topsoil, desiccation, loss of forests and grasslands, oasis, and the shrinking of rivers and wadis all have a major ecological effect. Additionally, with mankind's own proclivity for ecocidal behavior, we can be in little doubt as to the future welfare of the planet Earth. Recent research into the Schumann wave fluctuation patterns suggests that the planet may be slowly dying. Now the King Jesser from the third dynasty of Egypt, I am in mourning on my high throne for the vast misfortune because the Nile flood in my time has not come for seven years. Light is the grain. There is lack of crops and all kinds of food. Each man has become a thief to his neighbor. They desire to hasten and cannot walk. The child cries, the youth creeps along, and the old man falters. Their souls are bowed down. The counsel of the great ones in the court is but emptiness. Torn open are the chests of provisions, but instead of contents, there is air. Everything is exhausted. D. N. Wadia, in his book, The Post-Glacial Desiccation, of Central Asia looks into this problem also. He writes, in Asia Minor and Syria, which is called the graveyard of a hundred cities, in Iraq, which possessed not many centuries the most fertile plains between the Euphrates and the Tigris, the granary of the ancient world, in parts of Iran, India, China, the same sequence of events has happened. Increasing dryness, migration of the indigenous flora and fauna, erosion of the soil, cover by wind and undisciplined rush of water across the fields during the few occasional rainstorms and the loss of vegetation cover. These ravages of nature have been supplanted by acts of man, his misuse and neglect of soil, overstocking and overgrazing of cattle, deforestation, political turmoil, and the depredations of war. So could this be true? Could it be that Gaia itself is dying? Here are the scholars talking about the post-Diluvian world, all the inhumanity and injustice and cruelty and want of the post diluvian empires. E. F. Huntingdon, in his book Principles of Human Geography, writes, 
In all parts of Palestine, unnumbered ruins show that once the population was more dense than now. In Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, the terraces of vineyards, the cisterns of farmhouses, strewn scores of barren hillsides, or are scattered far beyond the limits of modern habitations. Old villages are waterless. Elsewhere, the limestone hills are so devoid of soil that a single farmer, and far less a whole village, could scarcely find land enough to raise crops. So from just a cursory look at some of these accounts, we can see that something is seriously amiss with the health and the welfare of mankind and of the earth in the post-axial shift, in the post-deluge, and in the post-war of the gods, leading up into modern times. Which leads us again to the more specific question of the nature of evil and the origins of evil. Because these external events, a war of the gods or the destruction of the earth, what is that doing psychologically to the mind and to the heart of man? He's already in a schizoid situation because of the tampering with his own biology, his own DNA, the fundamental essence of a human being. He now has to deal with the fact that he's part alien in his nature. And this alien, cold-blooded, merciless nature sitting beside his human nature, his symbiotic connection to the earth and to the matrix of the universe. And again, the ancient mythologies have a great deal to say about all of this. In the book of Enoch, the child which is born to you shall survive on the earth, and his sons shall be saved with him. When all mankind who are on the earth die, he shall be safe, and his posterity shall beget on the earth giants, not spiritual, but carnal. Canon George Rawlinson, he speaks of this genetic devolution. They were the boldest mariners, the greatest colonizers, who could boast a form of government approaching to constitutionalism, who of all the nations of time stood highest in practical arts and sciences, and into whose lap there flowed an increasing stream of the world's greatest riches, until the day came when they began to care for nothing else, and then the enjoyment of the material comforts and luxuries took the place of the thirst for knowledge. We have Commons Beaumont talking about the great falling off. For many generations, reports Plato, the people of Atlantis despised everything but virtue, not caring for their present state of life, thinking lightly on the possession of gold. But in time, the divine portion began to fade, and their human nature got the upper hand, having been too often diluted with the mortal admixture. The Atlanteans became unseemingly and base, having lost the fairest of their precious gifts. Now here, Beaumont is phrasing it sort of differently. He is emphasizing the falling off, but as many Christians also think, this is separation from God. We're handed this cartoon idea that because man has distanced himself from the Creator and from God, that is the account. That's the reason for his moral falling off. But could it some, be something much more intricate than that? Something more elaborate? Not just a simple falling away from spirituality, but actually a schizoid nature within himself. In Lenormand and Chevalier's Ancient History of the East, they write, In these legends we find traces of a wealthy nation, constructors of great buildings with an advanced civilization analogous to that of Chaldea, professing a religion similar to the Babylonians. A nation, in short, with whom material progress was allied to great moral depravity and obscene rites. Hermes Trismegistus. So the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing, and only evil angels will remain, who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches by main force into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and robberies and frauds, and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. The pious will be deemed insane, and the impious wise. The madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked man will be esteemed as good. From the Norse Edda, we have the prophetess predicting the falling off of man. In the caption, it says, then saw she wade in heavy streams, men, foul murderers and perjurers, and them who others' wives seduced to sin, brothers slay brothers, sisters' children shed each other's blood, 
hard is the world, sensual sin grows huge. These are the sword ages, the axe ages, shields are cleft in twain, storm ages, murder ages, till the world falls dead. And in a similar refrain in ancient Ireland, the prophetesses and queens of the Tuatha Dé after their war with the dark powers, Queen Bave goes up onto the mountain to proclaim the victory. But in doing so, she also offers this prophecy. And I want to emphasize that this prophecy we're about to look at comes 5,000 years BC. Shall we think that the world that she is talking about is the world that we now have inherited? Then she added a prophecy in which she foretold the approaching end of the divine age and the coming of a new one in which the summers would be flowerless, the cows milkless, and the women shameless, and the men strengthless, in which there would be trees without fruit and seas without fish, when old men would give false judgments and legislators would make unjust laws, when warriors would betray one another and men would be thieves and there would be no more virtue in the world. From the Vishnu Purana of the ancient uh, Sanskrit people, we read, there will be contemporary monarchs reigning over the earth, kings of curlish spirit, violent temper, and ever addicted to falsehood and wickedness. They will inflict death on women, children, and cows. They will seize upon the property of their subjects and be intent upon the wives of others. They will be of unlimited power. Their lives will be short, their desires insatiable. People of various countries intermingling with them will follow their example. Wealth and piety will decrease until the world will be wholly depraved. Property alone will confer rank. Wealth will be the only source of devotion. Passion will be the sole bond of union between the sexes. Falsehood will be the only means of success in litigation. And women will be the objects merely of sensual gratification. External types will be the only distinction of the several orders of life. A man, if rich, will be reputed poor. Dishonesty will be the universal means of subsistence. Weakness, the cause of dependence. Menace and presumption will be substituted for learning. Liberality will be devotion, mutual assent, marriage, fine clothes, dignity. He who is the strongest will reign. The people, unable to bear the heavy burden and the load of taxes, will take refuge among the valleys. Thus, in the Kal age, will decay constantly proceed until the human race approaches its annihilation, its prayala. Here we have it, millennia old prophecies, not talking about the world that they inhabit, but the world that is to come, from the Book of Enoch to the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Skaldic Edda and the Vedas and the Celtic myths and legends, all speaking about the end of the divine age and the coming of one in which depravity will be the norm. When we look outside the window today, when we lift the newspaper or turn on the television, these prophecies sound all too pertinent to the world in which we have inherited, and we have to deal with it. But could this world and all of these creations be the actions of the gods that we worship? Instead of falling away from the light and falling away from the gods, could it not be our allegiance to the gods that has actually caused this problem in the first place? Now, evil, of course, is a relative term. Those who prosper from their evil perceive it as good and see real good as a hampering weakness which needs to be repressed or even expunged. The propensity for immorality and evil which exists personally and socially came into being from the Atlantean hybridization process. Perhaps the Lemurians desired in time to reverse the process but lacked the technological hardware after the pole shift. Perhaps the alien gene was to be conditioned out, made less dominant by the reinforcement of particular ritualistic identifications with nature the supreme healer and balancer. This process was again, for the most part, thwarted by the advent of the unforeseen earth changes. And the net result is that the post-Diluvian humanity is left with the consequences of their schizophrenia, with each person condemned like Hamlets to deal with their moral dilemmas as best they can. As Nobel laureate Conrad Lorian said, man is the missing link between the apes and human beings. Like Mahatma Gandhi, when asked about civilization, he said, yes, it would be a good idea. And the great scientist and uh, humanitarian Wilhelm Reich said, civilization, we have never had it yet. And as we saw earlier, the very word Adam originates from a word, Adam, 
in Semitic, which means cut off or divided, cut off from nature, cut off from himself, and cut off from that which is his true destiny. You can't tinker around with a natural order, and you certainly can't tinker around with the genetics of a human being and have everything be all okay. And then if man inwardly, psychically, phrenically is in turmoil, what is likely to be happening to the world that he builds around him? What's likely to happen in the relationships that he cultivates? The great scientist and biologist and student of schizophrenia, Julian Jaynes, according to Jack Barringer, Jaynes claimed that this period, thousands of years ago, was a time of intense psychosis for the emerging human race. And Terence McKenna, in his interview in the Institute of Noetic Science magazine, he says that Jaynes has suggested that human consciousness has changed its character even in historical times. The ego, as we now know it, was not really in existence except under extreme stress. And then it presented itself almost as an exterior intrusion into consciousness, like the voice of a god. Julian Jaynes and R.D. Lang and some of the other scholars who are studying the nature of the human psyche are saying that the ego is a modern thing, a modern creation, and only came about in us because of the trauma which was visited upon us after the pole shift and the subsequent war of the gods. It was the stabilizing psychic muscle that kept us from completely falling apart, spiritually speaking and mentally speaking. Sigmund Freud had the same idea, but perhaps he was looking at things from the wrong end of the telescope. According to Theodore Rozak, Freud traced the original psychotic trauma to the mythic father of us all, somewhere in the dim prehistoric past. In effect, the archetypal father figure invented the repression of the instincts, first by emasculating his sons, then by becoming the focus of the remorse they felt for venting their murderous rage upon him. That's right, it's one of the earliest theories of Sigmund Freud, the idea of the primal father, the oppressor, that the sons have to rise up to kill, creating primal guilt, the original sin. But perhaps Freud was on to the subject, but not got it quite correct. Perhaps it was the father, the Atlantean fathers, that caused the psychosis. And in fact, if we look at our human fears and phobias, it might make more sense to think of them rather as psychological phobias and fears, but that their origin may be physiological. For why is it that we're scared of thunder and lightning and of darkness and caves and hollow places? We have fear of water, we have fear of heights, of loneliness, of insects and certain other animals, and of unclosed spaces and even paranoia against foreigners. And it's always put down to us by the psychologists that these are psychological fears, they just came about. So a man's fear of the ocean, that deep fear, that just came about psychologically. What? From a homo sapien that's meant to have existed on the planet with oceans for perhaps millennia? Why would you have such an irrational fear? But wouldn't you have that fear if you racially encoded into your DNA, encoded into your racial memory, saw the whole earth torn apart, visited by unimaginable ravages, and it was an historical blink of the eye. Such events are written in our genetic memory, and that is the origin of all these fears and phobias. They are physiologically based, not psychological. Terry Kellogg emphasizes the fact that abusive behaviors, whether we direct them towards ourselves or other people or other species, are not natural to human beings. People enact such behaviors because, he says, something unnatural has happened to them. I and they have become deranged. David Watson in The Pathology of Civilization writes, We reproduce catastrophe because we ourselves are traumatized, both as a species and individually beginning at birth. Because we are wounded, we have put up psychic defenses against reality and have become so cut off from direct participation in the multidimensional wilderness in which we are embedded that all we can do is to navigate our way cautiously through the humanly designed day-to-day -day substitute world of symbols. A world of dollars, minutes, numbers, images, and words that are constantly being manipulated to wring the most possible profit from every conceivable circumstance. The body and spirit both rebel. James DeMio in his Sarah Rasia, 
destructive human aggression and sadism in its worst forms to include despotism, warfare, ritual murder, and the brutal subjugation of females and children for sexual purposes are a relatively recent development in human history of less than 6,000 years duration, traceable back in time to Central Asia and Arabia. One of the statements that Plato made about the location of Atlantis was through the pillars of Hercules. And people thought that that meant, again, something physical. All the literalists took that to mean, yes, the pillars of Hercules. That is, if you go westward through the Mediterranean, you'll arrive at Spain, and then you'll pass out into the Atlantic Ocean through these pillars of Hercules. But the writers of old were brilliant storytellers and often wrote in allegory and in fable using symbolism, rich symbolism. A closer reading of Plato, and we find that the pillars of Hercules were something quite different than some physical pillars at the gates of the Atlantic Ocean. The pillars of Hercules are the twin columns. We see a lot of uh, images of the twinning. Here in the Egyptian, we have the two trees that stand either side of the gateway. In great structures like the uh, Taj Mahal, we see the twin columns. Here in the tarot cards, we see the priestess between the two temples of Solomon. And the black and the white pillars always represented the banks of a river, like the banks of the River Nile. Occasionally, we see heroes or even the Christ figure situated between two pillars to emphasize symmetry and opposition. Here in the Celtic books, again, we have the saint between two pillars. In Freemasonry, we see also a great deal of emphasis on the two pillars, the pillar of the sun and the pillar of the moon, the pillar of the east and the pillar of the west. And anyone who takes the time to visit a Freemasonic lodge will always see these two columns uh, prominently displayed. In Babylon, we have the strange image of the tree of life between the two hybrid deities. We have the twin serpents of the Maya. And we have the Babylonian chalice of initiation showing the two serpents or the two pythons entwined. These, of course, are representing the two natures of mankind, that man is now a bipolar entity. Young children are wont to remark when seeing the deities of India as to why they all possess these four arms. Well, if you have four arms, it often implies that you're two people in one. Two people in one would make four arms. And we have the left wing and the right wing again of Egypt. Freemasons also have a central figure in the double-headed eagle. One head of the eagle or phoenix facing east and the other facing west. If one studies a swastika, you'll find that it originated with two ser serpents. The file fought, the original symbol of the swastika, comes from two interlaced serpents. And as we saw earlier, mythology is replete with the war, the conflict between man and his hybrid nature, his own lower self. The Old Testament puts it this way in a passage that relates to the conflict between Jacob and Esau, we read, In your limbs lie nations twain, rival races from their birth. One the mastery shall gain, the younger or the elder reign. But these are not just myths. As Carl Jung and his approaching the unconscious writes, the universal hero myth always refers to a powerful man or god-man who vanquishes evil in the form of dragons, serpents, monsters, demons, and so on, and who liberates his people from destruction and death. So the mythologies may often be referring to what appears to be an external conflict, a great hero fighting a dragon, and it can be read like that if you're so desired. But we need to also realize that these external portrayals represent the inner conflict, man fighting his own nature, the two brothers, the two twins, the higher and lower natures, Lucifer and Satan. It's inside. 
For some of us, it may be nothing more than the conflict over a more petty side of us. Shall we steal? Shall we not steal? Shall we rise over the bones of another individual? Shall we lie? Shall we cheat? And for others, it's a much greater conflict. Joseph Henderson, he writes, in many of these stories, the early weakness of the hero is balanced by the appearance of a strong tutelary figure or guardians who enable him to perform the superhuman tasks that he cannot do unaided. And let's not forget again that with this schism, with this inner conflict, the brain moves into a left hemispherical type of thought and the feminine is repressed. And when you repress the feminine psychologically, you also do so sociologically. And therefore we have, from 11,000 years on, from the advent of official history, we have the rise of patri patriarchy and patriotism. Patriarchy arose after the threat of invasion, conquest, and war. Tribes feared being overtaken and decimated, and therefore, out of necessity, strong male leaders began to replace the female matriarchs. This, of course, is the official line. Well, if your world has been in chaos, and you can hardly even feed yourselves, let alone build cities and fortify yourself and protect, of course, now the balance completely changes. Those who were close to nature, the woman would have been more in the forefront politically, religiously, and socially. But once the earth is in upheaval, and now all you need are the muscular skills in order to be able to secure yourself and your culture, your race, your people, suddenly the masculine abilities, the masculine powers become dominant. P. Stern, in his prehistoric Europe from Stone Age man to the early Greeks, writes, the influence of the mother goddess, who had been all-powerful during the Stone Ages, now began to wane. Male deities, gods of war and conquest were in the ascendant. James DeMille remarks on the advent of patriarchy. There is no evidence to suggest that peoples of the more fertile times went about warring with each other, nor did they possess child abuse practices. The female principle was held in high status, or possibly revered. Where rock art was the dominant form, the female is seen to have occupied an equal or even central place in society and was not viewed with anxiety by the artists. Royal tombs, excessive grave wealth, female grave murder, temple architecture, fortifications, weapon technology, and the fully blown nomadism were absent from these early cultures, as were male gods and phallic imagery. In all cases, the arrival of militant armored no nomad groups from Central Asia and Arabia initiated cultural transitions which destroyed the male, female, and maternal infant bond and placed all family matters in the hands of the dominant males. The early peaceful people were either exterminated and replaced by the armored newcomers, or they were enslaved, losing their own cultural identity and legal controls over their land, property, and very lives. The once self-regulated free choice of sexual partner and mate selection was increasingly suppressed and subordinated to the demands of parents, priests, and kings. An emphasis upon military matters occurred with strong men leaders growing in power and veneration to the point where the masses enthusiastically genuflected to divine kings. In all cases, change towards increasingly stratified political hierarchy and despotism was accompanied by institutionalized changes in family structure towards an increased male dominance over basic life decisions of females and children, an increased control over children by parents of both sexes, sadistic abuses within the family, in society at large, and in the military appear to have increased in direct proportion to these changes. Polygamy, the harem, veil, general seclusion of females, sexual slavery, male and female genital mutilation, the eunuchism, all developed within the Sarasrasian zone as power of dominant males, divine kings, and military castes grew. So we have something very serious happening here to mankind, something that is out of nature, out of context, and something that can only affect us in an extremely negative way. But these, again, utter changes are merely the mirror, the projection of what is happening to an individual within. The original tweaking of our DNA has caused all of this. That, compounded by the earth changes, so severely traumatized the human race that we have the ego replacing the self as the center of consciousness. We have the masculine proclivities becoming dominant. 
all of these atrocities that we see in the so-called modern world can be traced back to an origin. But this origin has been concealed. And the reasons for all of these traumas and horrors of the world has also been concealed. You put religious in front of us and a god, and people stop thinking. We have this phenomena in ancient literature, and we also have a modern questions arising as to the reptilians. After the pole shift, the Atlanteans continued a seek and destroy policy against their nemesis, the Lemurians. Despite having scant technological hardware, they also managed to continue some primitive genetic experimentation. The fauna of the Earth was studied, and eventually, alien DNA was crossed with that of several species of creature. It was found that the reptile possessed the qualities that the alien masters of Atlantis had desired all along. So after you've failed twice with uh, humanoids, and you know that going back to the drawing boards again is not probably going to work, and you don't even have the technology anymore, you don't have the super technologies and the computers and all the uh, laboratory equipment that you once had, that's all several fathoms beneath uh, these new oceans that have appeared, what do you do? The ancient legends say that they went back to the drawing boards for the third time, and this time they said, listen, why do we even deal with a humanoid in the first place? That's been nothing but a cause of problems from day one. And there's plenty of other life forms and species on this planet. And perhaps they had done like that on their own planet. So, they experimented on all the fauna of the Earth and crossed their alien DNA with many of the species of the fauna, including the reptile. And that is where we have the theory of the reptilians. The reptilians are not from other planets. They do not come from other solar systems and visit the Earth. They're actually made right here on the Earth. All mysteries, all history, all mythology is filled with images of the strange births of the unicorn and the minotaur and the centaur and whatnot. And we have the mythology of the siren coming out of the Greek mythology. Of course, we have the symbolism of the dragon again. But these are dragons who have the gift of speech and the gift of wisdom even. Clement in his apocalyptic fragment writes, and on earth shall be monsters a generation of dragons of men, and likewise of serpents. David Fidelier, in his Jesus Christ, the Son of God, writes, Delphi was also known as Pytho because before the coming of Apollo, the site was haunted by a monstrous serpent or dragon. And from the Babylonian legend of creation, we read that men with bodies of birds of the deserts, human beings with the faces of ravens, these the gods created, and in the earth the gods created for them a dwelling. In the midst of the earth they grew up and became great and increased in number. This legend is talking about that not only were these beings created, but they were created in laboratories perhaps beneath the earth. And somebody would say, well listen, if there are these reptilians, how come we don't see them walking around today? These in individuals, because they also possessed alien DNA, could look quite humanoid. Because the original aliens, as we said, were not serpent looking. They were humanoid looking. Ostensibly you could walk past one in the street. And some of the reptilians would have been born like that also. Though they had reptilian DNA, they could look quite human. And some look very reptilian. So the ones that looked too reptilian, they were phased out or moved into caverns beneath the earth. Some people say they still are there. And that is why even up to the Middle Ages, you always hear about the hero having to go and prove his manhood by knocking on the door of some dragon and do battle or conquest with some hideous monster. So right up and almost until modern times, history confirms that such beings existed. And again, from Babylon, we have architecture, sculptures, bas reliefs, images, sculptures, showing hybrid animals and hybrid creatures. Here on the left is a phoenix-type bird, the Babylonian uh, eagle gods. On the right is a reptilian lizard, a uh, female with her offspring. We have cave paintings of erect, standing, bipedal, lizard-type beings. One of the greatest American scholars in this subject, Professor J.J. Hertak, says, in our research we have come across statuary of very grotesque beings who, according to the Indian and shamanic tradition, went into the earth at the time of a great cataclysm. 
So from all over the world, we not only have the stories of heroes and gods and uh, great uh, conflicts, but again, we have the hybrid being the hideous monster. We have suppression of facts regarding the skulls and skeletons of these types of being. And slowly it's coming to light. G. Warren Schufelt, uh, a researcher, discovered the underground tunnels beneath Los Angeles, which the Hopi Indians had for centuries believed were inhabited by a lizard race over 5,000 years before. Robert E. Dickoff, in his book Agartha, tells of a Tibetan monk who learned that an alliance of reptilians and human black magicians were causing chaos and destruction in the surface societies by projecting malevolent energy fields into people's minds using what we call witchcraft, uh, the manipulation of energy. Dickoff says that the monk led 400 warrior monks into the caverns to do battle with this serpent cult. And in Ireland, again, the Celtic legends, we have the Formorian race. This is the earliest prehistoric visitors to Ireland before any of the other races got there. And as we learned earlier, the Fomori means giants, but it also derives from a term meaning those from under the sea. And if you read Celtic mythology, you'll actually come across statements of the Fomori and realize how the gods had to fight them. And there's descriptions of these beings, descriptions of them, descriptions of their king, description of their heroes or so-called warriors. It makes fascinating reading. In the Emerald Tablets of Hermes, we read that only by magic could they be discovered. Only by sound could their faces be seen. But you know, the masters were mighty in magic, able to lift the veil from the face of the serpent, able to send him back to his place. Came they to man and taught him the secret the word that only man can pronounce. Swift then, they lifted the veil from the serpent and cast him forth from the place among men. Yet, be aware, the serpent still liveth in a place that is open, at times to the world. Unseen they walk among thee in places where the rites have been said. Again, as time passes onward, shall they take the semblance of man. Speak I of ancient Atlantis, Speak of the days of the kingdom of shadows. Speak of the coming of the children of shadows. Out of the great deep were they called by the wisdom of the earth man. In the form of man they moved amongst us, but only to sight were they as men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted. Crept they into councils, taking form that were like unto men, slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling over man, to destroy man and rule in his place. Here we have an interesting Mayan picture of a god on the left with some kind of weapon and a shield coming to do combat. But if we study the image on the right hand side, we will see that it's a large green serpent that has a man in his mouth. There's a large green serpent devouring a human being. If we study this corporate logo from the Italian company Alfa Romeo, we not only find a Knights of Malta or Knights of uh, Columbus, Knights Templar cross on their left, but we find, strikingly, the very same symbol on the right, a green serpent devouring a human being with a crown above the serpent's head. And curiously, Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi has exactly that image in his garden, a large black serpent with a crown devouring a human being. And many corporate logos feature the symbol of the serpent, either in a designer uh, abstract way or in a much more clear way all throughout the world. In fact, the, world, the word Pepsi actually means serpent in Egyptian. In Egyptian, they used to scare their kids by saying, Pepsa will get you, or Apep, and Pepsi was the name of the devil in Egyptian. In this uh, Origins and Oracles series, the uh, program entitled Subversive Use of Sacred Symbolism goes into this in a great deal of depth. And we might ask, who is protecting us from those supposed to be protecting us? Here's the symbol of the Marine Corps with a large green dragon in the motif.
and many, many features, many, many uh, programs, not only for adults but also for children, and many movies extensively feature the symbol of the lizard or the reptilian. One could do a five-hour program on that alone. Many involve uh, not only the symbol of the dragon or the serpent, but also of the Masonic pyramid. In the movie Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger, we actually see one of the heroes or anti-heroes of the show actually turning himself into a lizard. This film is situated clearly in pre-Diluvian times. The whole motif of the movie is to situate it in prehistoric periods. But we find it in much of our modern context in music. We find the, the bestial symbols being used in the music business and in the corporate world today. Dick Gregory, the famous comedian, says, pay attention to Hollywood movies very carefully, for they normally tell you in a subliminal and occult way what they're going to do. Of course, we noted earlier that the caduceus of Hermes is the worldwide symbol for the medical profession, but here the World Health Organization uses clearly the symbol of the serpent. And in fact, our symbol for money, the American dollar bill, the symbol is this, two parallel lines vertically piercing the letter S. But in fact, that is a very ancient symbol. Here in a table of ancient symbols, we find the dollar sign, or what looks like the dollar sign, but that sign was originally known as a scourge. Now, if you look up the word scourge in a dictionary, it will tell you that it is a whip, or a bond, or a lash for brutalizing and keeping people in order, for keeping slaves in order, the scourge of the worlds. Now the reptilians that possess and control many of the corrupt world leaders who engage in pedophilia and ritual murder for the same reason, having access to precise genealogical records, they know who to seek out as victims, those innocent that are of the Lemurian bloodline specifically. This is the answer to much of what lies behind the exposés of Kathy O'Brien, Arizona Wilder, Bryce Taylor, and others who have come forth to reveal what they have seen and experienced behind the corridors of power. The hybrid reptilians were created to seek out and destroy the Lemurians on behalf of their alien masters. This was like their day job. This process has not ceased in ancient times, but still goes on today.